64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Hello, and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor, SF Walker. I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. Today we look at the Immortality Key, the secret history of the religion with no name, by Brian C. Muradescu and Graham Hancock. In this video, we will look at if there is evidence of psychedelic beer and wine at the heart of Greek and Christian mysteries, and also evidence of their suppression by the religious authorities. We will explore if the only true way to experience God, and the simplest, most effective method, is to die before you die. What is behind the mysteries of Ulysses, the longest running and most prominent spiritual tradition in ancient Greece? We look at why is this chase for the kaikion, something that is still happening today, especially at the highest level, levels of top performance of the Silicon Valley. Did magic mushrooms play a pivotal role in the origin and development of humanity's spiritual awareness? Looking for an answer to a question. Is a society that fails to incorporate the mystical experience fundamentally flawed? Its institutions empty of the shared vision that made the world's first democracy actually work. So stick around till the end, as I will share with you a way to explore the mystery of yourself and your awareness. How to find out why you do the things you do. What are the hidden motivators behind the scenes, these innate human needs we're sometimes not even consciously aware of? Live doctrine fossilizes into dogmatism and the ethics and morality that attempt to translate mystical communion into practical living aren't reduced to moralism. But despite the dogmatism and moralism that inevitably mock up the system, the mystics have always come along with an, an embarrassing reminder for the self-appointed enforcers of the establishment's rules and regulations. When it comes to God, a word rarely used by the mystics, there is total unanimity on one crucial issue of paramount importance. God does not reside in a holy book, whether it's a Bible or the Quran. The mystics have never found God by reading about God. There is no class, no lecture that will ever bring you closer to God, because there is, in fact, absolutely nothing you could ever learn about God. For the mystics, the only way to know God is to experience God. And the only way to experience God is to unlearn everything the ego has been trying to vigorously manufacture since our infancy. In order to stop wetting the bed and become productive members of society, that deep inner peace circuitry of the right hemisphere has been sidelined along the way. To bring it back online, say the mystics, the simplest and most effective method is to die before you die. For a year, the author journeyed to Greece, Germany, France, Spain, and Italy to get to the bottom of history's best-kept secret, once 
and for all, if a psychedelic sacrament is essential for the birth of Western civilization and Christianity, where's the proof? Sitting down with the government's ministers, curators, and archivists, whose mission is to guard precious relics that rarely see the light of the day, grilling the excavators, archaeobotanists, and archaeochemists who are in the field and laboratory right now, unearthing fresh evidence of our ancestors' ritualistic use of drugs and subjecting it to the battery of high-tech instrumentation and trekking through time with the classicists, historians, and biblical scholars who are trying to make sense of it all. Not only is there evidence of psychedelic beer and wine at the heart of Greek and Christian mysteries, but also evidence of their suppression by the religious authorities. There has to be more to the mysteries of Ulysses, the longest running and most prominent spiritual tradition in ancient Greece. Unfortunately, it was shrouded in secrecy from the very beginning, leaving nothing but hints and clues about what really took place within the holy precinct. Aristotle once said that the initiates came to Ulysses not to learn something, but to experience something. Whatever that experience was, it has successfully eluded scholars for centuries. In the road to Ulysses, Gordon Watson, Albert Hoffman, and Carl Ruck made a passionate and detailed argument for why the Kaikion, the sacramental beverage of the mysteries, must have been spiked with one or more psychedelics. And they did so in truly interdisciplinary fashion, which was basically unheard of in the field of classics at the time. A J.P. Morgan banker turned amateur mushroom hunter, or ethnomysologist, as he would prefer to be called, one who studies the relationship between people and fungi. His global anthropological fieldwork had convinced him that magic mushrooms played a pivotal role in the origin and development of humanity's spiritual awareness. Clinical psychologist William Richards, the longtime collaborator in the John Hopkins psilocybin trials, concludes that ethics and morality are hardwired, perhaps genetically encoded within the human organisms. Psilocybin appears to unlock that code by tapping directly into what the mystics have been trying to mind over the history of Christianity, with all their chanting, meditation, fasting, and prayer. And what the religious authorities try to beat into young children, as if decency and virtue were things to be learned, rather than natural impulses to be coaxed into expression. Is this what Protexitus meant by Lucy's holding the whole human race together? Did the transformational inner journey unleashed by the Kaikion remind us how to care for one another and the planet? Was this the true technology on which Western civilization was built? Is a society that fails to incorporate the mystical experience fundamentally flawed, its institutions empty, of the shared vision that made the world's first democracy actually work. As the Gnostics used the term, we could translate it as insight, for gnosis involves an intuitive process of knowing oneself. And to know oneself, they claimed, is to know human nature and human destiny. To know oneself at the deepest level is simultaneously to know God. This is the secret of Gnosis. Orthodox Jews and Christians insist 
that a chasm separates humanity from its creator. God is wholly other. But some of the Gnostics who wrote Gospels contradict this. Self-knowledge is knowledge of God. The self and the divine are identical. Every governmental warning label on every bottle of Pinot in the United States cautions against a series of risks, birth defects, car accidents, machinery, disaster, not a single one, mentions the possibility of dead relatives showing up at the door with messages. McGovern's extreme beverage culture of the Eastern Mediterranean has crafted an extreme drinking ritual to accompany their extreme drink, perhaps providing the optimal setting to showcase their sophisticated understanding of the botanical landscape uh, and pharmacopoeic skills. <coughs> when we are talking about ancient wine, we tend to have a one-side-fits-all. Think about the beer these days. It's not just for drinking and watching football. We have some really complex beers with different alcohol and flavor profiles. Ancient wine was no different. If you look carefully at the historical record, there was wine for very casual settings, all the way to the very formal events, like the mysteries. But like everything else in life, it's probably not so binary. Maybe it's our puritanical background, but we want to separate the two, the casual mundane drinking from the sacred religious drinking. Back then, however, the lines were more blurred and things more intertwined. It's a neat line of succession. Osiris to El to Dionysus to Jesus. The critical thing that unites them all is extraordinary wine that blurs the boundary between life and death, immortality potions. But th there's a major difference between Dionysus and Jesus on one hand, and their divine predecessors on the other hand, a political disagreement. That this wine belonged to the 1%? or the 99%? Was it meant for pharaohs, royalty, and the elite? Or was it meant for everybody who should have access to the nectar of the gods? If drugged wine was the Greeks' path to immortality, did a drugged Eucharist offer the first Christians the kind of experience reported by the participants of the psilocybin experiments at Hopkins at NYU. If that original Eucharist could cause the disillusion of self and melting away of barriers mentioned by the Jews, Christians, and Islamic mystics throughout history, then it all makes sense. But without the genuine psychedelic sacrament inherited from the Greeks, how could a placebo Eucharist convince anyone to drop paganism and the entrenched religion of their ancestors in just four centuries. How did Christianity go from being an obscure cult of 20 or so illiterate day laborers in a neglected part of the Mediterranean to an official religion of Rome, converting half the empire, perhaps some 30 million people? When they said they drank the god of ecstasy, and became themselves divine. They meant it. And when new initiates tasted from the same cup, they too were converted. Because the Eucharist of the Dinosonian mysteries was pure magic. John could not possibly hope to sell Christianity to a skeptical pagan world unless the Eucharist of the Christian mysteries was just as magical. His entire gospel seems engineered to make the single point that the sacrament of Dionysius and the sacrament of Jesus are one and the same. And it all seems to be 
uniquely addressed to women. Women who would understand the secret symbols and the language, and women who had the pharmacological expertise to run with the new indoor Eucharist. Before Jesus, that primitive ritual of drinking the God to become the God had largely survived in the wild. With John's Gospel, this came to home, and it went viral. Because that's how religions are born, and that's how religions flourish, until the bureaucrats came along. But technology that time-honored and the advanced doesn't just evaporate. We have way more questions than answers. If whatever happened during the Last Supper was crystal clear, then Christian faith wouldn't have splintered into 33,000 distinct dominations over the past two millennia. Despite the relative agreement among the Gospel authors and Paul, until more material evidence surfaces from Jerusalem, it's frankly unsettled whether the Last Supper actually took place and is recorded in, in the New Testament or at all. No one has ever found the Holy Grail, and maybe no one ever will. If the wine that fueled this underground ritual was psychedelic, as Watkins concluded in his analysis of the very Homeric passage depicted, then it was just not just any religion, it was a religion with no name. Recently restored fresco might finally explain how the cult of the dead and the all-night communion parties refused to surrender to the Christian orthodoxy, because if life-changing visions of the afterlife were in play from Christianity's early days, from the house churches in the Corinth to the catacombs in Rome, then the newest mystery of the religion would not only have found a pool of willing converts among the Greek-speaking pagan population across the Mediterranean, it would also have the rural Christians glued to the graveyards of their rural churches for the next thousand years. After all, that's what the vision did in Ulysses. It brought the best and the brightest to the Demetrius Temple year after year for two millennia on one basic principle, seeing is believing. Could all of this be at least part of the reason, largely unstudied by modern historians, why witches represented the most dangerous of all enemies of the human race in the Christian Church? <clears throat> what is more threatening to the institutional integrity of the Vatican than a Eucharist that provides a true vision? If they could properly consecrate a Eucharist for themselves, what was the point of the priest then? And if they could establish a direct pipeline to God, perhaps the way it was meant to be, what was the point of the church? If there's really anything more worth defended, defending than the Eucharist, round and round we go. Some prefer reading about God. Others prefer experiencing God. If you're in the latter camp, the only way to experience God is to die before you die. And one of the most reliable ways to do that, say the heretics, is with the kind of drugs that reveal the cosmos for what it truly is, eternal, timeless. Only then, might the blind learn to see, only then might the mortal become immortal, because the initiate will have transcended the very concepts of past, present, and future, or life and death, where every moment is an eternity of its own, as an atheist once described it. Why wait for death itself to experience it, if you experience it while still alive, even once? then the last moment of your life is a return to something familiar. Practice dying, the philosophers have been telling us for 2,500 years, so that when your time comes, you won't even feel the flames that engulf everything you ever knew. This has happened before. You will remember, this is not dying. This is becoming God. 
the God you have always been, the God the Vatican would prefer you never hear about. When ancient Greek wine was described as a pharmacon, maybe that's exactly what it was, an unusually intoxicating, seriously mind-altering, occasionally hallucinogenic, and potentially lethal potion. And maybe Dionysius was not merely the god of wine, but the god of psychedelics. And there you have it. Please, do help out. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too. Spread the word. Leave a comment and share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read. Never stop learning. Especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you, what innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, your social awareness, your self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.